Next, we're going to talk about estimation, meaning that we want to estimate the parameters in our REMA model, the phi's, the thetas, mu, sigma squared w. Now, when we do come up with an estimate, we will refer to the estimate as something like phi hat 1. So we put a hat on top of the corresponding um, Greek letter to denote an estimate. So phi hat 1 estimates phi 1. And we're going to begin by looking at method of moments as a way to come up with estimates. Now, method of moment, moments estimation is a very common topic in a mathematical statistics course. If by chance you have not seen it before in that kind of a course, or if it's been a while since you've seen it, here's a really brief introduction into method of moment estimation relative to something that you would see in that kind of a course. So let's assume that x1 through xn are independent and identically distributed random variables that come from an exponential distribution uh, with a parameter theta. So this is what the actual probability density function function will look like, and x is always between 0 and infinity for this particular probability distribution. Now one can show that the expected value of x is equal to 1 over theta, or we could call that mu as well. The way that method moments estimation works is going to, first of all, solve for a parameter of interest, let's say theta, in terms of one of our moments, 1 over mu. And then what we do, simply we replace the moment, this mu, with this corresponding regular old estimate, in this case would be x bar, and thus that's how you get an estimate for theta. So theta hat is equal to 1 over x bar. With respect to time series models, we're essentially going to do the same thing. Okay, so to see this with respect to a time series aspect, let's go back to when we actually examine the partial autocorrelation function, and we uh, described how it came about. And so we looked at an equation such as this. Um, x of t is equal to phi 1 times x t minus 1. So I go back one time period. Plus, and we go all the way down to the pth term uh, in this autoregressive uh, representation. And w t is our white noise is going to be distributed independent uh, with mean 0 variance sigma squared w. And what this ended up leading to is a system of equations where we have the autocorrelations on the left side and on the right side we had some linear combination of the phi's with these autocorrelations. Note that these particular equations have a special name that's often associated with them. They're actually called the Yule-Walker equations when we think of this in terms of uh, trying to come up with parameter estimates. Then what we saw when we did the PACF, we said, well, let's take a look at a specific P. Let's suppose that P is equal to 1. So what that would mean then is that if P is equal to 1, we don't have this part of our model. We only have that part right there. And because of that, then, we would only have this part of the first equation. Rho of 1 is equal to phi 1 times rho 0. So if we now solve for phi 1, similar to how I solved for theta previously in that exponential example, then that means then that phi 1 is equal to rho of 1, because, of course, rho of 0 is equal to 1. So how would we estimate, then, uh, in a model that has just p equal 1, how would we estimate phi of 1? Well, just put hats on top of the corresponding values. And what that means then is that we calculate the autocorrelation at lag 1, the sample autocorrelation at lag 1, just like what we do normally, and this would be equal to phi hat 1. If p is equal to 2, what that means then again for us, let me do a little bit of racing, now we just have this part, oops, and that part of the model. So that means then, oops, sorry, let me get my eraser out again. Then that means then that we would not be looking at anything past that second parameter. 
And if we look at now, for p equal 2 again, uh, the first two equations here, that's all we need actually to estimate phi 1 and phi 2. So we've actually seen how these equations come about uh, previously when we talked about the PACF. And so how do we come up with phi hat 1, phi hat 2? Well, just simply put hats on top of all the sample autocorrelations. Okay, so we have ways to estimate our phi's. Well, what about now sigma squared w? Well, it ends up being this. Take your autocor I'm sorry, autocovariance at lag zero, in other words, the variance, times the quantity 1 minus phi hat 1 times rho hat of 1 minus all the way down to the pth term. Well, where does this come from? Well, you can see where it comes from is false. Let's look at the autocovariance at lag zero. That means I have the expected value of x of t times x of t. And how about we just put in, in terms of our model that we expressed before, what x of t is for that second x of t. Then let's multiply x of t through that quantity that's in parentheses. And so that's why I do, let's say, on step two. Then step three of this process, I bring the expectation through the sum. I also factor out constants. And look what I'm left with. Expected value of x of t times x of t minus 1, of course, is that autocovariance at lag 1. Expected value of x of t times x of t minus p is the autocovariance at lag p. But what about this term right here? What does that simplify down to? Well, it ends up simplifying down to sigma squared w, but why? Okay, well, let's actually put in then, again, what our model represents for x of t. So I actually put that in there. Here's my original wt that was right out in front. Okay, now, what ends up happening is, is that we have a wt times a wt, so that's where we get the expected value of wt squared. But the rest of the stuff, like wt times phi 1 times x of t minus 1, if you take the expected value of that, it ends up being 0. Well, why? Well, if you were to write out what x sub t minus 1 is, in terms of our autoregressive representation, um, you'll notice that all the corresponding time indices are less than wt. Um, and, of course, wt minus 1, for example, is independent of wt. So when I distribute an expectation through, I end up with just an expected value of a w, which ends up being 0. We've seen this kind of uh, representation before. So that's how you get just a sigma square w. So now once I have that, then how about we rewrite our expression so that just sigma squared w is on the right side. So let's let's say that's step four here. I'm sorry, on the left side. So next what I can do on step five is I factor out a gamma of zero from each of the terms on the right side. So for example, here's that gamma zero. That's why I have a one there. Now if you notice, there's no gamma of zero there at all. But if I take gamma of zero times rho of 1, that's equal to gamma of 0 times gamma of 1 divided by gamma of 0. Notice how that crosses out, and I get that gamma of 1 that we had previously. So that's how that term comes about, and the other terms within the parentheses come about in the same way. How do I estimate sigma squared w then? Well, simply put hats on the corresponding quantities here. And let's say I've already found what the estimated Fees are as well. <coughs> Excuse me. This is how I estimate sigma squared uh, w. Uh, what about, um, suppose though, if expected value of x of t is actually equal to, uh, is not equal to zero. Uh, of course, expected value of t is mu. Well, how would I estimate that? Well, just take mu hat to be x bar. And so now in our actual model, then, if this is the case, Excuse me. Now I'm going to have to write out my model in terms of having that constant term on the right side of the model. And we've seen previously that that would be alpha is equal to 
mu times 1 minus phi 1 minus all the way down to uh, minus uh, phi sub p. Just put the hats on everything, and there you get that alpha term. I'll illustrate that shortly with this next example, too, if it's been a while since you remember seeing that. Okay. So let's go back to our AR1 example that we've seen previously. Here's what the simulated data looks like once again. And the first thing that I want to do is I need to find some autocorrelations. So I'm going to use that to find my estimate of phi1 and sigma squared w and alpha. So as we've done before, I can use my ACF function there. I, let's say my data is in x. I say type equal correlation for my autocorrelations. Uh, R is going to produce a plot, but what we really want is to save these uh, actual numerical values into an object called row.x. And so if I print off that, here is phi hat 1. Now I can also use the ACF function to get my autocovariance as well. The way I do that is I replace the type argument with covariance. And here's what I get when I print off gamma.x, which, which is where I saved my results in. So gamma of 0 hat is 2.5. Gamma hat of 1 is 1.6864. I can also find then my estimated sample mean. So this is like our x bar uh, using the mean function. Okay, so what we've seen previously, if we were to estimate an AR1 model to this data that's been simulated from an AR1 model, what I need to do then is, first of all, state my model like this. 1 minus phi hat 1 times b times x of t is equal to, and while the data was actually simulated assuming mu is equal to 0, in a, in a real life situation, it's not good to assume that mu is equal to zero uh, for sure. Uh, and so I'm going to actually estimate then the corresponding constant term that comes with a, an AR model like this. And then there's my WT, where WT is distributed independent uh, with a mean of zero and a variance of sigma squared W and put a hat on top of that. Okay. So as we've seen, phi hat 1 would be rho hat of 1. So this is where I get my 0.6737. Uh, my sigma squared w, sigma hat squared w, is 1.361. How did I find that? Uh, again, I used the expression that we had just seen. Gamma hat is 0 times 1 minus phi hat 1 times rho hat of 1. Do all the math, I get 1.3671. Here's my alpha hat, negative 0.16. How did I come about that? Well, I use mu hat times 1 minus phi hat 1. That's how I get my alpha hat. Now, let's compare this to the way the data was actually simulated. So since I simulated the data, I know what the true parameter values are. V1 is equal to 0.7, mu is equal to 0, sigma squared w is equal to 1. So let's look at what would happen. Phi1 was 0.7. Look how close phi hat 1 was in this particular situation. Also, sigma squared w was 1. Look how close sigma hat squared w was. And mu hat was 0. Look how close mu hat was as well. So we're getting what we would expect to occur for data that's simulated from our corresponding model. Now, something that's very important to note here is that notice I'm not, let's say, saying a normal distribution here. I'm not saying that. Because with method of moments estimators and, and how this came about here, we actually don't need to make that assumption at all. And so that's one nice thing about using these kinds of um, estimators. Well, what about a moving average one model now? Well, previously, when we were working with the, um, uh, the autocorrelations, we know that um, for a moving average one model, the autocorrelation at lag one is equal to theta one over one minus theta one squared. Let me just write out 
what our model looks like here. Oops. So if I want to get an estimate for theta 1, I can simply use rho hat of 1 to help me. How? Well, I could rewrite this equation as basically a polynomial. So I have rho of 1 times 1 plus theta 1 squared is equal to theta 1. That implies then that rho of 1 is equal to uh, rho of 1 times uh, theta 1 squared uh, plus, actually, excuse me, minus theta 1. I'm going to bring the theta 1 over. Uh, and then plus rho of 1, that's going to be equal to 0. There's my polynomial equation. I can use the quadratic formula to find then the corresponding estimate for theta 1. It's going to be a function of rho of 1. And so just put halves on top of the rho of 1s, and there you go. Now in the end, notice you have a plus or minus there, so you actually have two solutions to this equation. Choose the one that satisfies then the invertibility condition. One interesting thing that happens here is that notice if rho hat of 1 is actually greater than 0.5 in absolute value. Look what happens. Underneath that square root sign, I'm going to have a negative number. So an estimate actually cannot be found in that particular situation. Now also earlier, we know from a MA1 that gamma of 0 is equal to sigma squared w divided by 1 plus theta 1 squared. So how do I find an estimate for sigma squared w. Well, simply solve for it and put hats on terms of the corresponding other quantities. Okay, some final notes here. I've already talked about um, the first one. Now, uh, the second note here is that method of moment estimates usually are not used as, let's say, the final estimates for parameters. Rather, the way that this is often used is that these um, uh, estimates that we get from method of moments are often used as, let's say, the initial estimates used for a numeric, numerative, I'm sorry, numerical iterative uh, procedure that actually will find a little bit better estimates. And we'll see what those procedures are shortly. Uh, estimates for AR only models are opt, are estimates for AR only models are optimal and what I mean by that in a mathematical statistics course oftentimes you talk about what does it mean for optimal meaning you have the smallest variance. Um, uh, estimates for models containing MA parameters are not necessarily optimal. Now if you wanted to just only do method of moments estimators um, for some reason uh, we, we will not but if you did um, and you wanted to calculate them automatically in R, there is a function called AR in R uh, that does the calculation for you. Okay, so that is an introduction to method of moments estimation for ARIMA models.